Well, good morning, everyone. Here we are on the weekly Sabbath in, in the midst of the two holy days of the Days of Unleavened Bread. If we look back in the time of Jesus, he would have still been in the tomb today, the third day in the tomb. Now, I've been in this series, The Ten Commandments, and thought came in my mind, well, you know, I could speak just about unleavened bread, but the commandments are really all about unleavened bread, if you think about it. If you live by the Ten Commandments, you're living an unleavened life. You are. You're living an unleavened life. So if you're out there online and you haven't heard the ones before this, I'm sorry, but we'll have them eventually here up on probably both Facebook and YouTube, the entire set. But today I'm on the fifth commandment. And people often say that the first four commandments apply basically to how we love God and the last six about how we love our fellow man. But when I look at the fifth commandment, I think it's kind of a, it's a crossover commandment between those two things. Because, well, let's read it. Let's read the commandment in Exodus 20 and verse 12, where it was first given, when God came down on Mount Sinai and he actually spoke the word, and then he actually, with his finger, wrote these commandments on the tablets of stone for Moses. Anyway, in verse 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh, your God, is giving you. Interesting part is, the last part there, it says, that your days might be long on the land which Yahweh your God is giving you. You know, the people that he spoke that to, the majority of them never got to that land that he was giving them because of unbelief. They did not have faith in the God who performed the, the ten great plagues in Egypt in order to subdue the Egyptians and bring them out. And then he divided the Red Sea and they walked across on dry sea bottom. And that wasn't just a little narrow path. There were more than a million of them. To get across there, it was a wide divide. <laughs> a wide divide. Believe me. But most of them never made it to the promised land. They did not honor their God, the God of the covenant. And that's why I say it's a commandment that has to do with honoring your fellow man, but also honoring our Father, our Heavenly Father, God. So only those under age 20, after they came out of Egypt, plus Caleb and Joshua. Those were the only ones that entered the promised land and could claim the latter part of this commandment, that your days may be long in the land which Yahweh your God is giving you. So if you think about the life of humans, don't the consequences of dishonoring Authority get more and more severe as you grow older in life. Don't the consequences get more severe? Think about that. If a person does not honor their parents, then they also won't honor God either. And they won't honor the authorities. So God deliberately put this as a prime commandment so that as children are reared, that they're taught to obey initially and then to honor. 
The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1, he says, The children of Israel all went through the sea. They were baptized in the sea. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You see, the God of the Old Testament that was with Israel was the one who became the Christ. With most of them, God was not well pleased. You know, they they dishonored Christ and the Father by the way they conducted themselves. But if you think about it, honor, when you think about honor, honor produces faith. They didn't enter in because of unbelief. And unbelief is just basically a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith. Hebrews chapter 3, and in verse 12, the writer of Hebrews here says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In other words, lacking faith. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And if you drop down to verse 16, he says, For who having heard rebelled. You see the children there, they heard these things. They rebelled. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Verse 17. Now with whom was he, meaning God, angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, lack of faith, unbelief. Jesus basically gave many examples that show honor. And I want to turn to one in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It's talking about Jesus here. It says, Then he, Jesus, went out from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And by his own country, by the way, he went to the town of Nazareth, where he grew up, where they knew him. He began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. They were astonished, not in a good way. They were, they were kind of hmm, puzzled, but frowning on this. They were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Isn't this just the carpenter? This is that carpenter guy. We know him. The son of Mary, his brother, James, his brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. We know them, and are not his sisters here with us. You know, this is just a family that lives here in Nazareth. Who is he? How is he special? Basically, that's what they're saying. So they were offended at him. Verse 4, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, honor. He's not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. You know, his own brothers did not follow him originally. They did not. He was without honor, even in his own house. Verse 5, Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled 
because of their unbelief. Once again, a lack of faith. Their unbelief. They didn't honor him because of a lack of faith, of unbelief. You know, familiarity breeds contempt. Have you heard that statement? Isn't that not true? Familiarity brings, breeds contempt. And the word familiarity comes from family. That's where it comes from. You know, we know family. We've heard them burp and do other worse stuff. You know, so it's, it kind of breeds contempt. We've, we see them do foolish things often, or we see them angry. You know, people don't honor people in their own family that they should honor because of this familiarity. <laughs> familiarity. I'm having a little trouble with that word. Matthew chapter 8. Let's go to another example here from Jesus. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Now, a centurion is a Roman officer, a Roman officer over at least a hundred Roman soldiers, a high-ranking man. And you got to think of it now, here in the land of Israel, even up here in Galilee where Capernaum is, the Romans were the rulers of this land. They are in charge. The Jewish people and the others living there were under that rule. But here's this centurion came to him and pleaded with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. So the centurion, who is a ranking officer, knew and considered that Jesus Christ was a higher authority. Even though Jesus is not part of the ruling class of the country or anything like that, this Roman officer realized an authority higher than himself. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. He knew that Jesus had authority. He recognized that. He said, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Faith. Why? Because of honor. He honored the Lord Jesus Christ, and he had great faith because he recognized that authority. I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed as you have had faith, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. You know, the centurion understood authority. People in the military understand authority. He honored the authority of Jesus Christ, Son of God. He recognized 
a higher authority than himself. You know, the reason that we people of today are probably one of the most faithless generations since the book of Acts is because we're a very dishonoring generation. The people of this generation, I include myself at times, are a dishonoring generation. So what, so what happens from that? Lack of faith. You know, returning, you know, the returning military from the Vietnam War were extremely disrespected in this country spit upon, all kinds of stuff. Terrible dishonor to those soldiers and military people who had nothing to do with organizing that war. They only followed orders. And yet they were terribly disrespected and dishonored. That's true. Police officers in this country are terribly disrespected and more and more and more. And it's because oftentimes the news media trumps up one or two or three here and there that do something wrong and commit a crime in arresting someone or shooting someone, whereas the vast 98% of the time they should be totally honored for what they're doing, how they're protecting us. They're disrespected. High government officials often even disrespect our police, unfortunately. Many officers are killed because of dishonor. Over the last 10 years, an average of 171 officers died in the line of duty every year. And a lot of that's from disrespect. And about 980 persons a year are killed by police officers. From those shootings, from 980 people that are doing something and the police shot them, two officers are convicted of a crime related to a fatal shooting. So it's a very, it's that very small proportion. Even though they're human beings, everybody's a human being, we're fallen, sinful human beings. To listen to the news media, you would think that most of those shootings are criminal. Look at the extreme dishonor toward our president. I mean, maybe you consider because he's a gruff, crude man that he should be dishonored. We should not dishonor anyone, especially the leader of our country. You know. It says in the scripture that we're to honor the king. We are not to speak evil of those in authority. You know, even when Paul was like arrested and he was slapped around and, and he said something against the high priest and they corrected him for it, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I know I should not be uh, you know, saying this about the high priest. I didn't know he was the high priest. So, extreme dishonor. I don't know how many of you saw, I don't know what the uh, thing was, but it was something over in Europe, and our president would, wasn't able to go, so he, he sent this very kindly Christian man, the vice president, Mike Pence, to go and represent our country. I think it was in France or somewhere. And the heir to the throne of England, Prince Charles, was coming down the line, shaking hands with the different leaders of countries. And he came to Mike Pence and he drew his hand back and he smirked and he went past. That's what I call dishonor. Extreme dishonor because I don't know exactly what his reasons were, but maybe he thought, well, Mike Pence believes marriage is between a man and a woman. So, and I believe in gay rights or gay marriage, so I'm going to snub him. I mean, that's dishonor. Dishonor to the hilt. You know, God gave this commandment because he wanted to teach people from a young age 
to honor our fathers and our mothers so that we would honor and respect authority as we grew up and became adults. Have you ever heard people angrily say, nobody's going to tell me what to do? I've heard people say it. I've thought it <laughs> sometimes about something. Some, oh, he's not going to tell me what to do. Maybe I didn't say it. But inevitably, people that have that attitude and keep that attitude, what happens to them? Anybody know? People that have that attitude strongly often end up in jail or in the military many times. <laughs> and you think they're not going to be told what to do there? They, they've got a problem up here if they think that's going to get them out of it. Another thing about honor, it produces blessings. Let's go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So the first line there, he says, children, obey your parents. This is right. Verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. Verse 3. That it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. It's, actually, this is almost a repeat of the commandment right here in the New Testament. So you might ask yourself, what is the difference between obey and honor? As far as, like, considered in the Bible, in the commandments. Simply, it's when you're young and in your parents' home, you obey. Or you should. And then as you grow and understand and come to respect and love the direction your parents are giving you, most young people begin to honor their parents as they get older. And then when you leave the home and have your own home, it's no longer obedience to your parents. You're, you have your own home, but you still you honor them. You should honor them at least. You know, when our children are younger, living in our house, we tell them that, or I told mine, that as long as you're under my roof, you're under my rules. <laughs> you know, you're eating my food, wearing the clothes I bought for you, you're driving the car that I let you drive, or whatever, you're under my rules. And if you don't want to follow those rules, well, you're free. Once they reach, you know, adulthood, you're free to go and find your own place, do your own thing. So as they grow up, most young people will also not just obey you, but they'll honor you. As they gain in wisdom and honor, you gradually give them more freedom. And if your teenager doesn't understand the principle of honor, then you have to keep them obeying, basically. It's more of a strict situation. It doesn't have to be that way. If you honor, if you obey, then the strictness will be relaxed. But there are adults, I know 40-year-olds or even older, that never learned to honor their parents. And so, they become those people that you're not going to tell me what to do. And so what do you see happen to them as besides eventually maybe going to jail or in the army? Let's say they get a job. Will they keep that job very long if they do not honor and obey what the boss tells them to do? Nope. You find that young adults or even older adults going from job to job to job the job because they haven't learned to honor and obey. If they had just learned it as children, what a much better life they would have. You know, the promise of the commandment is not just to live long, but that it may be well with you. 
And why would you want to live a long time if things aren't well with you? <laughs> I mean, if you're miserable, 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 why would you want to live a long time? I don't think so. So he says, that it may be well with you. You know, I've seen examples in our society of, you might have a family that has quite a number of children, and some of them it goes well with them. And out of the same family, same rearing, same background, there may be one that things don't go well with them, they never go well, What's the reason? They cannot obey and honor their parents, usually. That's usually the reason. That it doesn't go well with that particular child. In Romans chapter 13, Paul again tells us some stuff about authority. He says, in verse 1, Romans 13, verse 1, he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. What I want to focus on this, though, is in the very first line. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. The word translated subject means be in subjection to or in obedience to. Now let's take a look at example of Jesus. In Luke 2, we find the story of Jesus' family during these very holy days, during the Passover. They came down from Nazareth to Jerusalem to celebrate this Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, the Passover. And when the feast was over, their whole caravan of people that were going back up north to Galilee had left and gone for a day or so, and they camped, and lo and behold, Mary and Joseph looked around and know Jesus. Where's Jesus? They turned around and came back, and finally, after some time of searching, they found him in the temple. And we know what happened then. They said, you know, what, what, why are you, we've been worried about you. And he said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business. But then in verse 51, it says, Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Remember, subject means in subjection to or in obedience to. This is Jesus, the son of the living God. He's in subjection to and in obedience to his physical human parents. He was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You know, if Jesus, the very son of the living God, was in subjection to his parents, shouldn't we be? <laughs> I mean, come on. Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, and beginning in verse 8. The probably Solomon here, says, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So, you know, instruction from fathers, laws from your mother, they're like a graceful ornament. They're like, he says, chains about your neck is probably like a necklace, a beautiful necklace. Deuteronomy 27. In Deuteronomy 27, in verse 16, it says here, cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. Similar verses like Exodus 21, 15 says, he who strikes his father 
or his mother shall surely be put to death. You see, in the nation of Israel, that was serious, extremely serious. And in verse 17 of the same Exodus 21, it says, He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Pretty serious penalty. Proverbs 20 and verse 20. You don't have to turn to any of these, but I think they're on the screen. If you want to take them down sometime, look at them again. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. Proverbs 23 and verse 22. Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Proverbs 15 and verse 20. A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. Proverbs 19 and verse 26. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Now the next, the next scripture is a little bit, it's a little longer, it's about six verses, but it's very interesting. In Proverbs 30, beginning in verse 11, and it goes through verse 17. It begins with a verse about father and mother, and it ends with a verse about father and mother, and then see what happens in the middle. So let's read it. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. So here's a generation that doesn't keep the fifth commandment. Verse 12. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes. So, you know, when they don't do this, they're pure in their own eyes. They're pretty haughty, full of pride, yet is not washed from its filthiness. That generation is not washed from its filthiness. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. Their eyelids are lifted up. And there's a generation whose teeth are like swords. And fangs are like knives. In other words, their mouth spews vicious, harsh words. To devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Four never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. And then the last verse. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. So you start with dishonor, and you end the section with dishonor, and in the middle you see the awfulness of everything that's, that happens because of dishonor. Give and give. Give me. I deserve it. I deserve having. Give me more. I deserve it. That's a generation that curses its father and doesn't bless its mother. So it starts with honoring father, dishonoring father and mother, and it ends with not honoring. All because they didn't grow up with the principle of honor. Ezekiel chapter 22. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22. And here we begin in verse 6. Ezekiel 22 and verse 6. Look! The princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood. In you they have made light of father and mother. They've made light of their father and mother. In your midst they have oppressed the stranger. In you they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profane my Sabbaths. And that's 
what happens when you make light of father and mother. Romans 1, let's, let's go back to the New Testament here. Romans 1, and I want to begin here in Romans 1 in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things that are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. And then what's the next one? Disobedient to parents. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. You know, we're all sinners. We're all deserving of death. But this is what society's like that dis are disobedient to parents, that don't follow the commandments. And we find a similar thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul pretty much goes through much of that to Timothy and tells him to teach. Teach this to the Christian people you're that are being converted by God in your hands. He says, 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1, Know this. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, the, the, the word of God is just filled with scripture that having to do with honoring others. And I have no time to go through those, but I just want to mention a couple of tidbits here. Um, how about honoring your wife? Husbands, How about honoring, honoring your husbands, wives? How about honoring widows? How about honoring all people? I mean, these, there are scriptures that cover these things. Honor the king, and most of all, giving honor to God Almighty is heavily written in the scriptures. You know, one of the worst of despotic rulers in our modern age, in the last hundred years, was that man called Adolf Hitler of Germany. And do you know what one of the first controlling things he did when he began to found his government in Germany? One of the very first things, he targeted the children. He told them, they had them told in the schools, that if their parents disagreed with the government, to turn them in, report them. Report your parents if they disagree, if they're home saying, I don't, don't like what's going on here. You know, turn them in. Said another way, he taught them to dishonor their parents, essentially. He taught them to dishonor their parents. And look at the heinous disaster that resulted from that government. Millions of people died in that war, millions. And part of that had to do with the dishonoring of parents. Honor also produces destiny. In, he, in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 16, we find the second giving of the commandments. And here, the commandment is just slightly different here. It says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long. And then he adds this, and that it may be well with you. 
in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, that it may be well with you. Now, we read that in the New Testament, but the commandment over in uh, Exodus 20 doesn't have the statement that it may be well with you. But here it does. Here's Israel at the end of 40 years of wandering, those that were 19 years and under, plus Caleb and Joshua, are going to inherit the land that was originally promised to even their fathers. And he says, your destiny is for it to be well with you in the promised land. We as Christians have a destiny also. God has a calling and a destiny on our lives. A promised land for us. And we're to honor our parents that we may live long in the calling in that destiny that God has for us. Our current promised land is our life serving God right now. That is our current destiny, serving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and being. And where we have parents and others to honor, we honor them and we prepare ourselves for an even greater destiny in the future. Look at Matthew 15. Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1, says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. This is, boy, this is a big important point to bring up to Jesus, that they were transgressing the tradition of, didn't say the word of God, the tradition of the elders. For God commanded, verse 4, saying, honor, no, wait a minute, excuse me, verse 3 first. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Not because of the word of God, but because of their tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, that then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In other words, they said, oh, give your gift to the, on the altar, give it to the priest, give it to the Pharisees, give it to the Sadducees. You don't have to give it to your father and mother who may be old and poor and needy. So they made the commandment of no effect by their tradition. He says in verse 7, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Honor me with their lips. Honor is not what you say, it's what you do and what is in your heart. We need to ask ourselves the question, are we really honoring your parents? What if you had bad parents? We need to ask that question. Some of you out there online, some of you in here may have had extremely bad parents. Thank God I did not. I had strict parents, and I certainly didn't agree with them a lot, but I didn't have bad parents. But what if you did? What if you had bad parents? How do you honor dishonorable people? What's the answer? You choose to. You choose to honor dishonorable people. It's a choice. You choose to. You choose to understand that you were raised by humans, fallible sinners.
God's commandments are not old-fashioned. They are rightly fashioned, we might say. They're rightly fashioned. We have to forgive dishonorable parents. And it's not that we accept the way they live. You do not accept sinful ways. But you can still honor. The fifth commandment is God's word. It's in full force whether people obey it or not. But when we don't obey it, we will suffer the consequences in society. And we are seeing that. A very faithless, corrupt generation because of disobedience to all ten of the commandments, frankly. Not just this one. Let's obey and be blessed. God's commandments are only for our good. He gave them to us to show us the best way of life. They're well-fashioned. Let's live by the law of God. The laws of God are good for you. If you're out there online and you don't know the ways of God and you'd like to learn more, right there on our website is a phone number and an email address. Contact us if you need help. There's literature on our website and other Christian websites that'll help you. Get out of the rut. Get out of the disobedience to God and you'll find your life can turn around. Your life can be turned around. Thank you. And James, let's have another song praising God.